Hi, my name is Francisco Migoya. I'm the head chef at Mars Cuisine in Seattle, Washington. I'm going to give you a tour of our lab and I'm going to show you around some of the specialized equipment we have here. Uh, it's a really cool space. We're really fortunate to have this particular lab. So I just want to share that with you, show you what we do here and what it is that it takes to write the books that we write. This is our freeze dryer. So in the world of freeze dryers that come in many different sizes, uh, they come from very small like countertop uh, appliances to bigger ones. This is mid-range, even though it looks pretty big, it's, there's much bigger ones, uh, but it really, this one really serves our purposes here at the lab. So how does freeze drying work? Uh, it's counterintuitive when you hear it for the first time because how can you dry something through freezing it? And the answer is that it works through vacuum, uh, through vacuum pressure and through condensation. So what we do is we first put whatever we want to freeze dry in here. Let's say a watermelon. Uh, in this case, it was uh, fermented dough, uh, which I'm going to show you in a second. And so we freeze it first, uh, very cold, minus 60 degrees Celsius. Um, and once that happens, we put it inside here, inside this machine. So we close the door and you can see uh, around the door, there's a gasket. You'll see that in a second, but this gasket and this door Basically what happens uh, when we turn it on is a pump turns on and it starts to create a vacuum inside here. Not only does that happen, it also turns on into a, a very deep freeze. So it gets really, really cold. It gets as cold as the minus 60 degrees that we have the food at. So the idea is that every 12 hours or so, what we do is we turn the temperature up. And so what happens with that is that as the temperature goes to say minus 60 degrees Celsius to minus 50, there's going to be some condensation. Condensation is basically water or moisture from the food that's going to come up to the surface. But since we have this in a vacuum, that water on the surface is going to be pulled away. And that's how the process, the very slow process of going from a very wet food to a dry food occurs via freezing through that condensation. So after 12 hours, you turn the temperature up a little bit higher and so on and so forth until it reaches room temperature, which is 20 degrees Celsius, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. At this point, the food has no, mo no moisture in it, and that progressive increase in temperature basically drew all the water out to the surface. And what we have in the end is the food as it came into the freezer without the water. So you get the taste of the product without any sort of enzymatic activity that, occur that occurs through a, a hot drying process, okay? So to show you what we have in here, uh, this is a project that we did for our modernist bread book, which was we wanted to look inside fermented dough. You could ferment dough, you could freeze it, cut it in half and look inside. It never quite looks right because when you're cutting through it, what you're getting is the cut marks. Uh, you're sometimes, even though it's frozen, you're not going to get a very clean cut. So what we decided to do was to freeze dry the fermented dough uh, very quickly freezing it and then putting it in here for a few days until it completely dried out. So we were able to look inside and take some photographs of what fermented dough looks like inside without really compromising the integrity of the, of the fermented dough's crumb. So this has applications for those purposes as far as visualizing things, but also for food, for eating. If you've ever had ast astronaut ice cream, that's how it's made. It's basically ice cream that goes in a freeze dryer and it's dried through a period of days. While we use the freeze dryer for experimental purposes, we also utilize it for practical purposes, for food that is actually going to be eaten. Uh, it's not necessarily something that we write into our recipes necessarily because not everybody has a freeze dryer. So we utilize it to see how far we can push foods and ideas and experiments that we may have with the tools we have. So for example, an idea that came up when we were writing our pizza book was to make <coughs> a, a meta pizza. And by doing that, uh, what we meant was like really bringing all the flavors of a pizza as forward as we possibly could. So the first thing we did is we took tomatoes and we freeze dried them. So these are freeze dried tomatoes. Uh, these used to be red. They lose some pigmentation when they dry. Um, the idea with this was to, once they were freeze dried, to pulverize them and add that into the tomato sauce to bring the flavor up even more. But additionally, what we did is we made a margarita pizza. So this is a full margarita pizza that was freeze dried um, and then once we had this product, what we did is we pulverized it. So here, this is a pulverized margarita pizza that we then mix into our dough to make more pizza. So as you can see, we're building on flavor by adding components, uh, basically enhancing the components that are already in the pizza. So 
That's just one of the ways to utilize a freeze dryer. I mean, there's many other applications, but this is just to give you an idea of A, how we think, and B, some of the applications that we find for these tools. This is our photo studio, and this is one of our head photographers, Chris Hoover. Uh, Chris Hoover has been here for multiple projects, and this is where we take most of the pictures. We do all of our step-by-step -step photography here, uh, but additionally, we do uh, some of what are called beauty shots here as well. We do some on the field, and we do some you know, out in you know, different cities that we visit, but the majority happens here. Uh, Chris took about half a million photographs for our modernist spread book, and uh, you know, it's, I'm not exaggerating, that is actual, the actual number, close, or maybe even a little bit more. And we keep all those pictures just in case. They're not like discarded, the ones that we don't use. Uh, in the end, we about 6,000 pictures made it into the actual book. So there's a lot that goes on in here. Uh, Chris and the rest of the team, they build the, uh, basically the set, right? So this set is uh, still from the pizza uh, set, but we're doing some tests for our next project. Uh, uh, we can't disclose what it is yet, but they're basically looking at ways that we can make the most out of our studio. Sometimes it's modular so we can move things around, uh, but for the most part, this is where most of the step-by-step -step photography occurs. This is a rotary evaporator. In the world of rotary evaporators, it's a pretty large one, so we're fortunate to have this particular piece of equipment as well. And the way it works is, this is it's basically a way of distilling liquids, right? And there's many applications for distilled liquids, from making moonshine, which we don't do, uh, to concentrating flavors, for example, or steeping one flavor into another. So if you've ever had, like, say, raspberry vodka, this is something that you would probably use to do that. But what we're doing here is something that I wanted to do for our pizza book, which was to make a tomato sauce with a very concentrated flavor of tomatoes without actually cooking the tomatoes. If you think of the flavor of a raw tomato versus cooked tomato, these are very different flavors. They're both good, but very different. And I wanted to have that fresh taste on top of a tomato, uh, on top of a pizza, rather. So the way we do it is we put it in here. So if you come closer, I can show you how it works. In here, what we have is a water bath and a coil, and the coil warms up the water slightly. We don't want the water to get too warm, so this water is at about 45 degrees uh, Celsius, which is at about 110 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's, it's kind of warm, but not warm enough that it's going to create a lot of enzymatic activity in, in my tomatoes. So once we turn the water on and we turn this on, we bring the bowl up to come in contact uh, with the water. All right, so at this point, uh, there's two things that happen. One is I turn a vacuum pump on. So the vacuum pump is basically going to pull all of the air out of the bowl. Uh, and the second thing that I'm gonna turn on is a coolant pump, which is basically going to run a coolant liquid through this coil that you see at the top of the machine. Once we have the vacuum in place and the coolant in place and things are starting to go, the precipitation that occurs inside the bowl, the bubbling if you will, is going to force some condensation on the surface of the bowl, which is gonna travel through here, up through the coil, and the coil, because it's cold, is gonna concentrate all of those droplets of water into larger drops, which are then going to come out through here. So what we have here is a very clear liquid it's, it's, a, it's very odd because it's a very clear liquid, but it's gonna taste like tomatoes. We don't necessarily want this liquid. This is basically what I would say is diluting the flavor of the tomatoes. So some might utilize that liquid. I prefer to utilize what's left in here, which is a concentrated, fresh, ripe tomato taste. And this can go on a pizza pre or post bake. It's really you know up to whoever's making it. Uh, or you can do it both times. You can put it before bake and post bake and have that you know, fresh and raw uh, and baked tomato uh, sauce combination, which is, to me is very desirable. So this is one of the uses that we have for this machine. We've done other things in here, like we, we made a toasted brioche vodka, which was pretty delicious. Um, and you know, this is not something that we necessarily write into our recipes, even though some people do have the expectation that we're gonna have this in our books. We have a few recipes here and there. But these applications are not as practical for common use as, as, as we'd like. So we try to keep this more in a very specialized realm of recipes in our book. Our next machine is a texture analyzer. And our food science assistant, Kim Schleif, is the, uh, one of the machines that she mans when we're doing our experiments. And uh, 
I'm going to show you how it works. Now, it's very important to mention that this is a texture analyzer, but we've kind of like refurbished it right now to be a machine that is called an extensograph. What we're using is we're taking advantage of how this machine works, which is essentially a robotic finger that goes up and down, and we control how much strength that finger goes up and down with, uh, so that it can basically rupture through things, push down on things, and so forth. It gives us all that information via a computer that it's connected to. So our machine shop here basically built, it retrofitted this machine so that we can basically take strips of dough and basically measure the strength and the elasticity of different pieces of dough. Now, why is that important? It's important because if we're telling you, look, this particular type of flour is best for making this particular type of pizza because it's strong, but you can stretch it before it rips, that is an important assessment to make and it's an important thing to mention, not just say that, well, this is the flour we like because we like how it tastes, uh, because that taste is very personal, but science is very accurate and very factual. So if the machine tells us this dough is very strong, but it stretches very, very well too, this is a recommendation that we're gonna give you. Okay, so if you come closer, I can show you the mechanics of this machine. So, this is where we're gonna put a strip of dough. You can see here, this is, these are the actual dough pieces that we have. And to show you where, what this piece of, of metal is, it's basically a, a solid piece of aluminum that our machine shop cut into 12 divots. And the idea is to put dough here that is all going to be pressed down so it can give us evenly sized strips. Okay, so these strips are what you see here. Okay, so the idea is to take these strips and put them down here, close this up, and then have the robotic finger pull up. And it's going to stretch the dough until it snaps. And once it snaps, it's going to stop. So I'm going to show you here how that works real quick. Take a knife, grab the dough, and very carefully place it down here. We close it up and it's locked in place. So now you can see this hook here. It's going to uh, automatically pull up and you can see on the computer screen how the graph is moving up, up, up. And once the dough snaps, it's going to go down, okay? So you can see it's gone up, the dough has snapped and we have 11 more pieces. In reality, we only do 10. We have 12 just in case there's a piece that doesn't look very good or a piece that breaks. So the idea is to have 10 different strips that all go through the machine. And once we put all of the dough through the machine and it does all of the, the, uh, the dough pulling on them, we average out the strength that it utilized to rip the dough. So that is gonna give us a really good picture, a very accurate picture of what this dough is like. And we do this with many different flowers. We did this with every single pizza dough in our book, uh, which we also tested with a, new, uh, you know, a large amount of different kinds of flowers. Um, and this is to give us a, a, a picture that we can give you in our books as to what is a good recommendation of flowers to use for, for your different pizzas. So this is a, an example of retrofitting machines and the capacity to be able to do so in our particular lab. This is called an ultra centrifuge, and there's a difference between a regular centrifuge and an ultra centrifuge. Ultra centrifuges tend to have refrigeration, such as this one. It's important because these machines spin. It looks like a washing machine because it works in the same way, it spins. Although your washing machine at home doesn't spin as fast as this one, this one spins at around 10,000 RPMs. That's 10,000 times per minute that it's spinning. So that goes really fast, and what that creates is a gravitational pull at its center that is about 30,000 Gs of force. One G is uh, the force of gravity, like what we have here, what is keeping us on this earth, is one G of force. 30,000 Gs is 30,000 times that. So it really exerts this like pressure on whatever we're spinning in here. And we utilize it for different purposes. Think of something that is spinning that quickly. If, say, you put milk in here to spin that fast, what would happen is the milk would come out, you'd be able to see all the layers of milk separate from density from the lightest to the densest at the bottom, the heaviest at the bottom. So you'd see all the fat on top, the water, and then at the bottom you'd see all the sugars. Uh, if you were to put different things, like for example, we tried this 
uh, machine with different flowers, right? What we're trying to do was an experiment to see true hydration in flower. So we put different flowers with the same amount of water through the machine to see how much water was truly absorbed by each type of flower. It was very interesting to see because, you know, flowers, for example, like whole wheat flour absorb more moisture because they have the bran and germ that are water loving, where white flowers absorb less. And then flowers like rye, rye flour absorbs up to 16 times their weight in water. So it really holds onto that water. Even though it went for one hour at 10,000 RPMs, it did not let go of a single drop of water. So these are important things to see experiment wise, but we also utilize it to make food. So if you come closer, I'll show you what we have in here. You can see here, this is a barrel that we put these beakers in. And so this is basically a beaker. In here we have pea puree. This is just straight up frozen peas that you can buy at the grocery store. Uh, what we do with these is we weigh the exact amount inside this, this beaker. Uh, and we have to make sure that if we're, we can't, you can't just put one beaker. You have to put at least two and it always has to be symmetrically placed in here for balance. 10,000 RPMs that are unbalanced, if this thing flies out, it's a loaded bomb. Okay, so, and I'm not exaggerating, this could really be really bad. So we have to make sure that everything is properly weighed out. Um, once it starts to spin, what you're gonna see here is this is like a solid puree, but after an hour, I'm gonna show you what it looks like. You can see here, the separation of the components of a pea puree. So this here, this clear, this liquid here is delicious. It's, it's sweet. It has like the concentrated pea taste. It's a delicious liquid that we utilize for, say you can make pasta with this particular liquid. Uh, we also make a consomme with it. It's, it's a really delicious liquid. At the bottom here, we have what is the pea starch, which is when you eat peas, that mealy texture you get from them, that's what this is. But if you look very closely here, you can see a, like a different color green, a very thin line there. That is something that we call pea butter and it's our favorite part of the pea. It's the soul of the pea. There is no fat in pea, so you're not gonna have butter, obviously, but it has a texture of very soft butter and a delicious concentrated taste of pea without having that starchiness to it. So we utilize that, we harvest that pea puree, that pea butter, I'm sorry, uh, and we serve it on toast. It's, a, it's one of the courses that when we do dinners here, we serve. Um, we also do this with carrot, we've done it with corn, so there's many possibilities for this particular machine. So again, it's one machine that can do many different things. We're taking advantage of the property of centrifuging uh, to do different things with it. One of the systems that we utilize to measure results is a 3D scanner. We use a 3D scanner because it gives us very accurate volume measurements. If you think of something like a cube or a sphere, these are pretty easy to mathematically measure the volume of. Uh, but when you have something that is as organically shaped as a loaf of bread or a pizza, we need to have a different way of doing it. And there are different methods for doing it, but this we found was the fastest, more accurate, most accurate way to do it uh, just by using a 3D scanner. So we're gonna show you how we do it here and the, the apparatus and software that we use. So this is Evan Herman and he's been doing it for years. And we're gonna show you how we do it with uh, our one of the pizzas we baked earlier today. So what he does is he basically starts the 3D scanner and the scanner starts to go up and down basically taking a, uh, a top-down image of the pizza. Initially, we need to get that image, and then he starts to spin it so that we can get three, a 360-degree image of the actual pizza as well. So you can see on the computer screen how the 3D scanner is capturing it. So it's giving us a, a complete 360-degree view of the pizza as well as a top-down. So then the software is gonna take all of that imagery and put it together into a 3D image. Uh, so once that happens, uh, Emma's gonna show you now what that looks like. Here, you can see right now, it, it, it does it in orange because it's, it's much clearer to look at it this way. But if you can spin it, Evan, yeah. move it. You can see now we have a complete image of the pizza, top down, but also uh, you can see the actual measurement on the right side of the screen. So if you can point it with your finger, Evan. So that is giving us the accurate, the just like super accurate volume measure of this particular pizza. So why does it matter 
to measure the volume of a particular pizza. It, it is the gauge of quality for certain things, but also if you're measuring different fermentation times, different fermentation methods, different mixing methods, different types of dough, it's gonna give us something to compare one pizza to the other that is not just taste. Again, taste is very particular of, of, different, of a different uh, you know, person's taste, but something that is measured accurately with volume is there's very it's very hard to argue with it so whatever we're testing or experimenting we scan it at least three times and then we average out the volume of whatever we scan so it gives us a very clear picture of of what we're looking at uh, and we're able to give that information pass it on to folks that read our books so it's a it's a really important tool that we utilize here so this is our small chocolate production nook in the lab uh, chocolate is something that is very close and personal to me uh, so we have this area that we're going to be utilizing for future projects, but also it's set up really nicely. I think uh, what we have here is your your basic equipment that you would need uh, to run basically a, a, a chocolate shop, but also it serves the purposes of what we do here. So this machine, for example, is a it's called a panner. Basically, it spins. So if you've ever had M and M's or something like that, this is the machine that is utilized for that. It's for coating things with either sugar or chocolate uh, and making them nice and round. This machine, it's great. Uh, when people ask me, what's your favorite way of tempering chocolate? It consists of pressing exactly one button because the machine does it all for you. Uh, and it's great because it can keep, this machine is I think the smallest one in the, in the realm of what this company makes. Uh, they make much larger ones, but for us it's 12 kilos. It's more than enough, okay? Uh, here we have an improvised spray station. So uh, this is something that is, it's important for a lot of people mostly because when you're spraying with chocolate, what you have is a lot of overspray. So it's, it's basically cocoa butter and chocolate that's getting everywhere, right? So we found a, a pretty, I guess, economical, clever way of keeping that in, in check, right? So uh, what we have here, this is an, uh, I almost say, said the factory uh, name, but it's a kitchen cabinet uh, basically it's it's vinyl coated so it's it's good for you know this, these particular purposes but the idea is that we have in here this is a, uh, a shop vac or a vacuum if you will as a hose that comes all the way up and it's on top of the uh, the cabinet so that when we're spraying in here what we do is we turn the machine on and everything is basically suctioned through here so whatever mess you might have in the air is all staying concentrated here. And these are things that you can buy in any like sort of home improvement store, right? So we have this machine, we have the smaller uh, compressor for detailed, you know, colored cocoa butter work here. Uh, we have these chocolate warmers, which we utilize for warming chocolate, but also if we need to melt cocoa butter or, and keep it warm, that's what these guys are for. This is another machine, it's called an Easy Temper, which uh, it, this requires a much longer explanation, but what we do here is we keep cocoa butter at a specific temperature that keeps it nice and soft. It's a great way of tempering small quantities of chocolate if you don't have the big machine. So this is a, a specialized piece of equipment for that. Uh, and then here we have, uh, this is our compressor. So when I was talking about spraying chocolate, what we do is we have this machine that we hook up to a gun, a spray gun, chocolate spray gun. Uh, this is the hose that it attaches to. And the idea is to be able to have everything neatly packed and tight enough so that we can spray and make, make the least amount of mess possible uh, with the right equipment. So this is our little chocolate nook here at the uh, Martin's Cuisine kitchen. Here's uh, other two specialized pieces of equipment. This machine is called a spray dryer. Uh, we don't use this machine all that much. If I'm completely honest, in the seven years that I've worked here, we haven't used it a single time. But this is a machine that is utilized for spray drying. So for example, a, a clear uh, product that is uh, manufactured utilizing this machine is milk powder. Uh, and if you've ever had this, you know, some of these um, uh, like Tang that is a, like a concentrated orange powder for making drinks, this is the machine that is utilized for that. Um, these are uh, machines that are very complicated to keep clean and maintain. Uh, and I suspect that that's why we don't use it all that much. But if we ever had to spray dry milk to make milk powder, we have the means to do it. Right next to it, we have a enormous tank of liquid nitrogen. Uh, this is uh, about 125 liters of liquid nitrogen. 
Uh, we utilize it frequently for many different things. Obviously, liquid nitrogen is extremely cold, so we take advantage of that those properties for doing different things. I'm not exactly sure we need 125 liters, uh, but it's it's good to know that we have it here. We have it available, and every week they come and replenish it, so uh, we're good to go with liquid nitrogen. This is a pretty unique piece of equipment. It's called an ultrasonic bath, and it's used uh, mostly in, for example, jewelers have this sort of apparatus because the way it works is it, it's, it sends these ultrasonic sound waves, and if you have, let's say, a necklace, a silver bracelet, or something that is tarnished, this machine through those ultrasonic waves, basically it, 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 it kind of like just punches it off of, of the jewelry and, and when it comes out, it comes out beautiful, super clean, right? So what we do is we take advantage of what those ultrasonic waves do uh, and we utilize it with food. And here's a, a pretty, I think, a pretty cool example of how it works. This is just a piece of foil and we turn it on with the machine for about an hour and you can see this is just sound waves, ultrasonic sound waves that are traveling through the water uh, and then just puncturing through the aluminum. So whatever you put in there, if it's very soft, it's obviously going to turn it into mush, but firmer things, it's basically going to, if it's jewelry, like solid silver, it won't damage the silver, but it'll damage whatever's on the surface, so dirt and whatnot. Uh, but we use this for food applications, and one of my favorite things is what comes out of here, which is something that we call an ultrasonic French fry. So, in here, what we have are potatoes that we have cooked. This is, they're sitting in a brine of water and salt solution. Uh, and these are potatoes that we've cut. They're all the same size. And they've been cooked in a steam bath until they're just cooked. Okay, so that's the first step. The second step is to actually put them inside this water bath. Also for about an hour. Because what we're looking to do here is we're looking to rupture the surface of the potato so that we have more surface area that's going to fry. So if you think of a flat potato with a smooth surface, you drop that in the fryer, you're gonna have just that area that's gonna be crispy, crunchy on the outside, and then the soft potato on the inside. But if we put it in the bath, the surface of the potato is gonna get like fuzzy, so we get more surface area that's gonna get crunchier. So you get more crunchy, and uh, you get the soft center as well, but you have the experience of a french fry is going to be super crispy on the outside and super soft on the inside. So, if you look here, you can see basically a before and after. Not super obvious before frying, but this is a potato after it's come out of the ultrasonic bath. And you can see here, very clearly, how it's ruptured the surface. And what you get is an extremely crispy French fry that is going to have that crunchy texture on the outside and very soft uh, center. So it's a the textural contrast between the, the you know, crunchy and the soft is what I prize most about a good French fry. Uh, this can actually be scaled up. We actually have a patent for this. Um, and you know, I, 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 if I owned a restaurant that sold hamburgers, this is absolutely how I would make French fries. Okay, this is a rotostator homogenizer. And think of it as you're basically like a handheld blender uh, or stick blender, but a lot faster and a lot more powerful. Uh, this can get up to 18,000 RPMs. We don't use it usually that, at that speed. Uh, we use it at much lower speeds. But what it does is it creates fantastic, very effective emulsions. And the way it does it is by utilizing a wand such as this one. So it's called a rotor stator for a reason. It has a rotary part and a static part. So this, as it's spinning very quickly, if you see the distance between the rotary part and the static part, it's a very small distance. As it's spinning, it's forming tiny, minuscule droplets of one liquid to emulsify into another liquid. So if we have a vinaigrette, for example, and we're spinning at 6,500 RPMs, what you're gonna get is those droplets dispersing uh, it's basically the fat in oil that is going to be dispersing in, sorry, the fat in water that is going to be dispersing very efficiently, creating a really effective emulsion. So you can see it here, we're going to see it in action. What we have here is uh, balsamic vinegar and olive oil. 
and we have the wand in there. And I'm just going to turn it on. And you can see it. How it's creating those micro droplets and then just combining both very efficiently, very quickly. And we can adjust the speed here on top. But in a few seconds, what you have is a fantastic emulsion. Now, it's, it's, the size is maybe, maybe a constraint, but you're able to do, with this, we've been able to do up to a liter of vinaigrette. You can do aioli here very efficiently as well. So this is not utilized in kitchens necessarily. This is more of lab equipment, uh, but we have found a purpose for it in our kitchen. I'm gonna show you uh, how we make margarita Neapolitan pizzas here. I think Neapolitan pizza is one of my favorite pizzas, uh, obviously because it's great to eat, but also technically there's a lot going on with it. So I'm not gonna like hyper focus on like technique and so forth. I'm just gonna show you real quick how we do it here and just a few tips so you can get an idea of what we spent four years on. Um, so we're gonna get started first with our dough. Our dough was made yesterday and it's been balled up this morning. Uh, and it's 250 grams of dough that we're gonna shape right now. Uh, we're gonna put sauce and cheese on. So first thing is, I like to use, this is uh, some Molina Durham flour. So basically it's a, it's a little coarser of a flour, but, and it's also a little bit yellower. But what I like about this is that it really does help prevent the dough from sticking to stuff more than regular flour does. Regular flour has a smaller particle size, so it tends to absorb a lot more water, so it kind of sticks to your dough more. Where here, it, it really is a good, like, almost like ball bearings, keeping it off the table, keeping it off the peel. It also shakes off a little bit easier. So, uh, what we're gonna do first is we're gonna put a little bit of flour on top of it. I've already put a little bit of the semolina flour on where I'm going. I'm gonna use this. This is a basically a dough scraper, but it's really good for lifting dough and also for, you know, different purposes. Some pizza oils actually use it for cutting uh, garlic if they're doing a marinara pizza for example so it's a very practical tool so we use it to lift up our dough and put it right on our work table now I put it on with smooth side down because then the smooth side is going to be the top once I flip this over put a little bit more semolina on top you could do a lot more if you wanted to it's just to keep it from sticking to your hands and sticking to the table we're going to shake the excess off later anyway so we're going to be pressing down I don't it's not like you're playing the piano and it's not like you're mad at it. You have to be very gentle and you use this part of your fingertips, okay? So you're, you're basically pressing down from the center, the bottom, out. We're trying to push bubbles towards the rim and we're trying to make sure that we're maintaining a rim as well uh, around the, the pizza because that's what's gonna puff up when it bakes, okay? And I'm trying to make sure that I'm, I'm maintaining as many of those bubbles as possible. You can see here I have one side already formed, so then 180 degrees and do the same thing with my fingertips and pushing outward and maintaining that rim. So we have a preliminary shape here. If you see any large bubbles, it's a good idea to pop them, mostly because those bubbles have a very thin membrane on the surface and they're gonna burn in your oven. So something like this here, you can use a tool like this, which is uh, basically just a needle to just pop and get rid of. Uh, some pizza oils will just like smash them down or pinch them. It's up to you how you want to do it, uh, but you do need to make sure you're getting rid of them. So now we flip it over. I'm going to press down a little bit more. And this is going to be the top of my pizza now. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to extend it. There's different ways to do it. There's the, the Neapolitan slap, which is basically what I'm doing here, but a lot faster. Or you can use the back of your hands, which I prefer this because it really helps check shake the excess off but you can see it only takes a few spins a few turns to get my dough large enough to about 10 inches at this point about 22 centimeters I don't want it to get too thin either because I can always stretch it on my peel and then we go back on our work table and now we're gonna apply the sauce there's different ways of applying the sauce the Neapolitan sauce is a little bit looser a little bit wider because it's going into a very hot oven so it needs it needs that moisture so we can use this, which is basically a curved rubber spatula, or you can use this, which is a spoon that has a flat bottom, which helps to spread the sauce around. So there's a couple of ways to do it. 
Uh, the amount of sauce is uh, don't do too much, don't do too little. Uh, we give quantities in our book that are pretty precise, and you can get really good at them once you uh, you know get enough practice. You won't have to wait anymore. But initially, if you've never made this sort of pizza before, I do suggest that you go ahead and, and weigh the quantities that we recommend so that it's the same all the time. So when we put the basil on as well as any topping, I like to go symmetrical so that every slice or every piece has more or less the same amount of topping. So if you have really big basil leaves like this, good idea to just break them up. I'm going around the border. I'm gonna put about six pieces down and then a couple pieces broken up right down the middle. Next, we're going to put the cheese on. So this is fresh mozzarella. Uh, it's called fior di latte, technically, uh, but in uh, the United States we call it fresh mozzarella. So I like to basically cut it uh, the previous day and then drain it overnight so that we could get a lot of that excess moisture out. We don't want to have a pool of like cheese and sauce in the middle of our pizza. We want it to be moist but not have all of this water in the middle. So that's why we drain it overnight. And we cut it more or less the same size so that it will more or less bake evenly as it's cooking okay so uh, I put it on top of the basil to keep the basil from getting too dark when it's baking uh, almost to like protect it okay and then we're going to apply the olive oil so there's a couple different ways to do it you can use this this is the traditional cruet that is utilized go ahead and you know basically drizzle it on top not too much uh, you can also use a squeeze bottle this is easier if you just started making pizzas the core takes a little more practice uh, because you need to use gravity. You don't always know exactly how much is in it because it's not see-through, so it takes a little practice. So from here, we're ready to go in the oven. We're ready to go into the oven. Uh, there's different ways to go from here to there, uh, but we always will need a peel. So you can either slide the peel under the pizza or slide the pizza onto the peel. I prefer to pull the peel onto the pizza for this particular style it allows me to first of all make sure that I'm getting rid of any flour underneath but then I can reshape it as I see fit on top of the peel. This peel is really good for this particular pizza because again any it's very thin but also any excess flour that I may have is going to fall off. Okay, We don't want to have flour baking onto our pizza. So we take it from here and we just pull on it gently right and then we just reshape it slightly on the peel it doesn't have to be perfect, right? We're not a factory. We're making a pizza by hand. And so from here, we go right into the oven. Don't spend too much time here because it'll stick to your peel. Okay, so we only have about 60 seconds, 90 seconds maximum. It doesn't take very long. The moment I start to see some color on the crust, I'm gonna start spinning. And I'm utilizing this particular peel. It's called a spinning peel. It's a smaller peel and it's it's meant to go under the pizza and to help me spin it as I'm uh, baking the pizza so I get an even bake. You can see we get some nice lift on the crust. So I go underneath very carefully, very gently, and I'm going to start to spin my pizza. doesn't take very long as you can see. We have a nice crumb on the surface. Okay. If you want to, you can spin it constantly as it bakes or just spin it, rotate it so you get an even bake throughout. If you want a little bit more color on the inside, you can go back in, but the Apollo pizza shouldn't have a lot of color. You can always do what I'm going to do, which is called doming. So we go in, a little bit more on top, just because it's super hot on top, just for a second or two. And then we come out and have a really nice looking pizza. A nice color on the crust. A nice puffed up rim. This is a, something that you really want to see in your Neapolitan pizza, which is called leoparding, uh, which is a little bit of char, but it's not burnt, right? Uh, Neapolitan style is it's just, I wish you could smell what I'm smelling. It's just this delicious combination of tomatoes, basil, cheese, and the dough. Uh, it's, a, it's a pizza that is the original pizza. What's, what is there not to like of it? So this to me is a pizza for one. I would eat this entire thing very happily. It looks like more than what it is. It's really just like, it's, it's about 250, 300 grams of food 
delicious, eat it while it's hot. Well, that's about it. Thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, this is what we get to do every day, day in and day out. Uh, some of the stuff that we utilize. There's also really ordinary stuff that we use as well. But these are the highlights. These are the things that I guess we're known for. Uh, and we get to use them uh, on a very regular basis. So hopefully it inspires you. Uh, you know, this, this is uh, what we love to do. And hopefully we, we were able to share that with you. So thank you so much for watching.